I think every presentation should start off with a check, check, check on the mic, make sure everybody can hear us. And just so you know ahead of time, we will not be repeating any questions at the end. So, you know, it's like you hold the sign up all you want. <laughs> we will just ignore it. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for having us over here. I know we only have 25 minutes, so if I seem rushed, it's because I am. Uh, I'm Brian Freeman. This is uh, Michael Rutt. We're from uh, Byte Core FSD. It's a division or a sub-company of uh, Nuance Communications. Um, you know, Mike actually said once that, uh, you know, he kind of felt we had the best job in the world because uh, we get to spend all day coming up with ways to create multimodal, multi-platform, collaborative, interactive systems. Um, and just for the record, multi-platform does not mean Mac and PC. Uh, we'll get to that a little later. But um, you know, we spend our days trying to figure out how we can use OData uh, to form a collaborative backbone so that we can actually take command and control systems, which are nothing more than Microsoft Project on steroids for people that have to manage troops and draw maps and have plans and make them available across a variety of systems and a, and a variety of form factors from a vehicle to a handheld to a Microsoft Surface table and beyond. So what we did is we, we took one particular system that we're going to be talking about today, because we, we actually have a Java O data provider, which we can talk about tomorrow. But today, we're going to be talking about a WCF-based one. Um, so we're going to give you a quick background of what the command and control system is and how we're making it better by using O data. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and start talking about what we did on the provider side, which is a complete custom provider, and then what we've done on the client side, which is, again, it's a custom client side. And then we're going to go actually go back to the 360 on this and tell you what the people that are paying the bills thought about it and how they reacted to us using OData to solve problems. So the command and control system of choice today is something called CPOF. It stands for the uh, command post of the future. It's a, uh, a DARPA research project that you know, went out and explored different ways of visualizing and sharing or networking data. It's a real system. They call it a, a, a record system of record in the Army. Uh, it's used by a lot of different uh, areas in the DOD, not just the Army. But primarily, you'll find it out in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what it does is it basically gives you essentially a common operating picture from the general down to the major and so on and so on. Uh, so it has to provide many different views, and it has to provide ways to share and collaborate on data, anything from maps, what's on a map, to a task list, have tasks been completed, where is a Humvee, is it in a line of sight of an attack that's going to take place. Everything is in this system. I have some trivial examples I'll be demonstrating to you to give you a sense of what it looks like, but I can't actually show the real system because then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, this is the Microsoft Surface version. People find it interesting because it uses a Microsoft product. Uh, that's Surface 1, that's Surface 2. You can tell because this one's more of a square and that's got more of a widescreen effect on it. But basically, Mike's going to talk about that in a lot of detail. But running on Microsoft Surface is not running a WPF application. Uh, there's a lot, actually a lot more work into it. A Surface table is something people gather around, all the way around it. And depending on where you are on the table, the uh, orientation of what you're working on faces you, and the orientation of what someone else is working on faces them. And you collaborate either on your little separate windows or on the same window all at the same time, and your gestures are particular to yourself. So you can have four people, five people touching the table, and it does work, which is totally different than our WPF version, which is a single user mouse click experience. Uh, this is a little more down to earth. Uh, single user experience on Silverlight. Uh, what we have is just a simple explanation. This, all this data is coming from O data, the map. And I'm going to get some more detail about that soon, but everything you need to know about going to war and fighting is in this system. Where, and uh, what happens is with any plan, you start off and then things change. So, I, I mean, the second I turn around, you know, all of a sudden, O data is got a version bump on it. And uh, so one of the things 
that we did is we wanted to show people that if we use OData as a collaborative backbone to store all the data, not just some of the data, um, then when people put links to the data inside documents, like what's the name of the latest version of OData, or what are the tasks for configuring a customer demo, when those things change, the collaboration with OData will provide an experience so that you can understand the change and cope with the change in an environment that's appropriate for you, be it Word, PowerPoint, or a custom military application. So in this case, I have a polling here. I'm going to hit refresh just to show you that you know a simple custom XML bound field in Microsoft Word using the sample code off the odata.org with revision tracking in Microsoft Word can actually give you a compelling experience. So now anytime something changed in our plan, I don't have to go back and play catch up with everybody asking them to proofread my documents. Pablo updated the version of OData. Bang, I got it. It's in my document. The OData. So, you know, and in a typical Word fashion, you go into your reviews area and you would accept this change. And then once you accept it, the color coding goes back to normal. So standard, uh, uh, you know, tra change tracking in Microsoft Word. Very powerful, though. Uh, just excuse me while I get back to the demonstration, which is proving to be difficult. So the other thing is, you know, PowerPoint has the same problems as Microsoft Word. Uh, this one is pretty much terrible. Uh, OData spelled wrong. So first thing we got to go do is go fix OData so it's actually spelled correctly. And the second thing, if you notice, not a very appealing map. So using OData and some uh, fancy client-side code, I'm going to go ahead and load up the current version of the map, which is actually rotated correctly. Um, and it has the symbology, you know, kind of where I want it so that the, you know, the mission in Baghdad, you know, looks appropriate in my slide deck. And then as soon as I like where it is, bang, I got it. My PowerPoint slide deck is up to date. I go live, and I have it. And this is all about running an OData, and I'll be more than happy to share every detail about it with you tomorrow, about how that all works. So custom OData provider that we had to tackle had a very narrow API that we had to deal with. Uh, it basically gave us an entire dump of everything that was in it, and then told us every time a change came in. Not very exciting, not very friendly. So. What we did is, you know, we chose to use SQL Server for indexing the data coming off the SOAP wire because we needed to do the uh, expression tree process, processing. And the easiest way to do that is to use a link provider that can process the expression trees. So SQL Server comes to mind. So we immediately take all the data from SOAP, we put it in SQL Server, and that's where we process our expressions. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into doing that. You have to make sure you have, you know, track everything correctly and put it in there. But the rewards are you have a very high performance index that you can run your expression trees against. Um, and then when it comes to uh, doing updates, we just implement the standard iUpdatable interface and actually do our updates. But the story is not that great at first. It was a hard start. And this is after watching all the videos. Uh, what do they call it, Dallas or something? I don't know. It's like all those videos from 2010. Um, the data model of our target system has derived types in it. And it's awful hard not to have derived types when everybody's expecting them. Uh, those derived types have many to many relationships in them. So you can think of it as a document, and documents are subclass, and documents can contain other documents, and so on and so on. Um, not very friendly to the first version of the, the bits that shipped. So we had to do numerous workarounds, the code generation of thousands of lines of code to actually generate backing uh, hierarchies of derived types that we could use to back them and then have the concrete ones actually exposed in OData uh, to make top level collections of all our derived types to try and work around this problem. A lot of work. Uh, anybody that uses the new version, you will not appreciate the amount of work we had to do. Uh, of course, numerations aren't there. Uh, we chose to go with um, 
collections of entities and just have a relationship, a link off that for all our enumerations, because uh, we have to provide uh, all tons of things, color, graphic types. This system has three-dimensional graphics for helicopters flying through mountains. Um, we had to handle all that. We had to handle all the three-dimensional representation of space and put them in, inside of OData. That's why when we finally got some 2D representation, we're like really happy. It's like that could make my life a lot easier. Because then all these ones would be covered. I could just focus on the 3D aspects of it. Um, if you haven't, there's some uh, really good books that uh, the one was about a, uh, the DLR that actually talk about expression trees and how this is all calculated. It's worthwhile to check into. If you think you're going to do a custom provider and you have not, uh, you know, really looked at expression trees and iQueryable interfaces, check it out. You do need to look at them. They're important until someone changes it. Um, and when you write your custom provider, make sure you test projections, or select statements right away, because the code in the data services class uh, has a projection wrapper that will move your properties into and cause you issues if you think that your POCO classes are actually going to go through all the way to the end. Um, complex types. We actually started off with iQuery Toolkit because we found the entity framework provider to be so subpar that we said, well, I, I got to do something. I need, I need to write code first because when you're in a group situation, writing code, uh, drawing a picture, and generating an EDMX is, is not a very pleasant experience. It wreaks havoc, the slightest little change. And, that's, and then someone commits it and pushes it back to the repository, and you don't have the faintest idea why it got pushed back. Um, it could have just been someone sliding things around. So code first is your best friend for a variety of reasons. So we went with the iQuery Toolkit because we could do the code first implementation. A couple user contributed bug fixes, away we went. Uh, we got pretty far, and we realized that we could not put complex types into an expression, and we had to like kind of revisit that or spend a lot more time trying to fix iQuery Toolkit. And if anybody here wrote that, it's a fascinating piece of code. Sorry we had to abandon it, but we wanted to go more mainstream. Uh, let me just move forward real quick. Um, anybody think about doing it, go code first. Implement your own uh, metadata provider. It's not that difficult. Take control of your life. Uh, don't, let the, don't let it crawl your object hierarchy with reflection, looking for exclusions on things you don't want to publish. Uh, make sure that when your metadata comes out, dollar sign metadata, unit test, make sure it's the same every single day. Don't just assume it is because the, your code looks like it hasn't changed too much. And uh, when you do the, no matter what you do, you're going to get stuck doing an uh, update provider. And that's as complicated as complicated it can be. It depends on the system you're going back to. You have to take your representation and OData and convert it back to the original system and submit whatever API calls are necessary to get that updated and then make sure that correlates back and everything is kosher with your index and SQL Server before you can move on. Uh, we're going to do a lot of work with the stream provider. As you saw on the map, we had some graphic symbol representing some military symbols. We plan on making all those binary streams available through OData, including the map tiles. Uh, we went ahead with a, uh, a comment uh, polling approach to, uh, for the current version. There is a streaming example up on the web. Uh, it's better overall, but the we went, reason we stuck with the comment polling was because it allowed us to use our clients unchanged. Um, that, you know, no code changes at all. You, when an OData client calls a service, it does a request. As long as it finishes within the required timeout, it gets an answer. That fit very well in the comment polling as opposed to the streaming where you have to have a little bit of a custom take on the client and you have to monitor the stream coming back and peel the, uh, the uh, en entries out of it at live and then raise events up. So that's the main reason why we didn't go with it first round. Now I'm going to hand this over to Michael Rutt. He's going to talk about the client side of what we've done. Okay, so this will be pretty brief, but uh, I'm just curious, has anyone here implemented a fairly complex client row data? Is your microphone on? It is now. Can anyone hear me? Is it better? Yes. A little bit. Okay. 
Uh, I can't hear very well. My ears never popped coming down in the plane last night. So Mine just did. I have no idea what's going on. Um, okay, so a few people have, maybe. Uh, has anyone used Silverlight to implement the client? Windows Phone. Windows Phone, okay. That doesn't count. All right. No, sorry. <laughs> a little bit different, right. Uh, okay, so basically, yeah. we started off with uh, a Silverlight client. I'm not going to go into the whole story as to why we did everything we did. But we started off with the Silverlight client, and we used the uh, MEF uh, framework here, MVVM, you know, your typical stuff. And uh, essentially, when we were working with our customer, we decided to continue moving into all these other platforms because we wanted to show that our code is sort of like write once, run anywhere, right? So uh, we were able to take this core functionality, uh, the talk to OData, and write it so that it would run in Silverlight, WPF, on the Surface table, and even Mono. So it could run it on an Android device or an iOS device. And uh, this is what the customer wanted. And um, so this worked out very well uh, in the beginning, and we made everything cross-platform. But what happened is we ran into a few problems. Because everything was written in .NET, we were using WCF data services. Uh, so the first thing that, that we stumbled across is the read-only fields. Uh, if anyone's used this, it sends, whenever you want to update an object, it sends back every field on that object every time. And uh, we looked online and we found something written by, I think, James Van Beek is his is name. Here? James? Yeah, I don't know. No. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it was uh, data services extensions. And it worked very well. So what it did is it would send the data in the Atom XML format but it would intercept it right before it went out, and it would strip out all the fields that you actually didn't modify so that only those changed fields would go across. Uh, it worked pretty well, except we wanted to use JSON. So, uh, you know, that, that was kind of an issue. Um, so we kept upgrading, hoping that one day this would actually work in one of the latest updates. And we went to the October 11th uh, CTP of WCF Data Services, and it wasn't added there, but that's okay. However, that broke some necessary queries that we were doing because we were kind of polling the server every now and then to see if something changed. For whatever reason, it broke it. So we finally uh, left the WCF data services realm and just wrote our very own uh, simple client. Oh, that's right. So, th so then the next thing we were going to try is using the OData lib, which, which came along with the latest version of WCF data services. Uh, however, I don't think it's supported in Silverlight, and I don't know if anyone could correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there was actually a Silverlight version. And since all our code was shared to run on all these platforms, we decided to not use that as well. And this is when we just essentially wrote our simple uh, custom JSON-based library. And it's very simplistic, and it just goes out and makes simple queries and handles everything. And we actually did this um, modeled after the, uh, the URI and the URI builder in .NET. We just created an OData URI and an OData URI builder that we could create uh, these items with. So, so kind of given that, um, you know, this first, first line here, too much fragmentation in choices, right? So fragmentation is a very commonly used word these days. And uh, it's really that the choices, none of the choices actually work. Right. So, so our issue is when you're trying to write a client, and we, we have to sell our customer and say, okay, OData is a great solution because we can write this great provider and everything. But not only that, any developer can just come in and get a client SDK for their platform and connect to your, your data and start talking to it very easily. Uh, but when you start going out and looking at these SDKs, you find, oh, this one's great, except it doesn't support select statements. Oh, this one's great, except it doesn't support this. Oh, this one's great, except it has a bug and no one's updated it since, uh, you know, February of 2010. So we were just, we were having a tough time finding the proper SDKs to use, and that's essentially why we ended up with our, our simple JSON uh, approach. So I don't know if anyone has stumbled across this, but, um, you know, we do feel it is, a, it is a bit of an issue. I don't know the best solution to that. Um, you know, one thing would be nice is if we just kind of had this, we call it a bare metal cross-platform client library, right? So if you use the jQuery stuff, um, it's very simple to, to query the OData service and get data back. And uh, if we just had something that it was just kind of worked on all these major platforms that everyone is targeting right now, there's like four or five of them, uh, that would be great. Or even taking OData Lib and just make it, making it cross-platform. Um, I know we're here at Microsoft, but that's something that, uh, you know, everyone's interacting with all these different devices, as the previous discussion talked about. Um, also, obviously, the, the client change tracking would be fantastic in uh, WCF data services. We have a thing, graceful metadata versioning. Basically, what we were saying here, and I don't know if it's a problem specific to OData, but, uh, you know, if you're using a library that generates proxy classes, like WCF data services, uh, we would generate the, cl the, the proxy classes, and then we might add a field and then suddenly it would say there was a metadata conflict and you couldn't talk to the service. 
Um, so if there was a more graceful way to handle that, that would be good. And then obviously, uh, or I'm sorry, last of all, we have uh, client support for OData providing, not just consuming. And this might be something a little bit more unique to our approach, but I'll let, yes. I'm just curious as to why you want to use OData Live on, on the client side, since. I, okay, curious why we wanted to use OData Live on the client side. Yeah, so what does it provide uh, that you need on the client side? My, my understanding for OData Lib, and I, I just glanced at it, was that it was another way to a lower level approach to accessing data uh, from a client. And maybe I'm wrong on that. Yeah, and I guess the overall. If anyone's used it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a fair statement. Of the... Thank you. I think that's a fair statement. In general, it's a low level way of accessing. Uh, or data or producing no data. Uh, I would say the two primary motivations for using no data leave is either you want a lot of control and you're willing to give up some productivity on using the thing compared to higher level frameworks for control, uh, or you want to build a framework that is too different from the frameworks that are available today. Uh, like for example, the .NET client that we have for the data today is very statically typed and it's great if that's the kind of problem you have, but if you need to build something very dynamic like um, you know, something that's driven by schema on the flight and it can change services or something like that. Uh, you may want to have something that maybe uses the dynamic support in C Sharp and VB now, uh, except that, yeah, you want to replumb the top of the API uh, to do this different thing, but you don't want to write all the, you know, serialization and deserialization code, all the verification code that we already have in place. And these folks, uh, uh, folks that built all the Italy spent long, a long, long time tuning, you know, verification, validation, you know, compliance and so on. You don't want to duplicate that work. So I think those are the two primary reasons. In general, I would say if you are in .NET, you can choose to use or not use high level frameworks. Uh, I would, I would think very hard before passing on on all data leave because you're basically skipping on a lot of work that you're taking on yourself. Yeah, I, I, and uh, sorry, just one more comment. And if you think that you really have to skip it because it's not doing what you need, then just talk to us. We're doing it wrong. I mean, the purpose of that library is so you don't have, people don't have to write this, this kind of code. The, the, way, the way I'd ask it is what, what was missing in, say, the data services client, available on .NET and other platforms that would drive you to do something else on the client? That's a big question that probably could spend an hour on. Well, I, <laughs> I think, uh, well, it might be right. It might be something we can talk about offline. Um, yeah, and it's hard to get into it with uh, without going into too many specifics in terms of the the back end service that we had to talk to, which I don't know how much we could talk about. But well, the question was, why did we want to leave the WCF data services client to begin with? Just for the record. Right. It, now we have another mic question. I might say it says it's on. Testing. I'll speak really loud if it helps. Um, our last uh, comment is basically, you know, we always assume that we're connected to the internet. In our world, we're not. And then sometimes on the cell phone network, you're not either. Uh, so one of our goals is when we, you know, wrap up our current line of work, is to get funding for looking into what I call the bump sync, the op, op, <laughs> okay, now I'm not gonna be able to say it, but optimistic syncing. So one of them our envision is that I'm using OData as a collaborative fabric that I don't actually need to connect to the OData server to get information. Um, and we're hoping that uh, there's gonna be more information on where the Microsoft Sync framework was going from some of their offline clients. But if you think for a second about OData and what it really represents, it's a way to uniquely identify an element of data, something that you're interested in. And you know, let's not get into access control list right now, but who can see what for a moment, because it just adds complexity to it. Uh, if you start using the e-tag aspects of it, uh, it actually gives you an immutable reference to an item of data. So that, that, and then if you take that to the next level, uh, you take, you make, basically start making your OData clients, OData producers, and then they can actually take the data they have received and reproduce it to other OData clients who have not yet discovered that piece of data. And then, you know, and borrowing a little bit from the 
you know, change control, distributed source code control. You can actually just, you know, start assigning some global hashes and keep track of your prior e tags. And I believe that we could actually have a, a network, an ODN of mesh, so to speak, so that a variety of people that may or may not have been part of this OData server experience could get data and then I could casually just walk over and bump into you. Maybe I'm out in Iraq, maybe I'm downrange, and I, I come across you, and if I have new data that's of interest to you, using the standard distributed code techniques of resolving merges and looking at the, the data, I can actually give you the elements of OData and send them from my client-side OData provider to your client-side OData consumer, and we form a peer-to-peer -peer mesh of exchanging the OData data. And, uh, and I think that's something that not only can you know, benefit the Army world, we have disconnected operations where people aren't always connected, and we need to have other ways of disseminating the OData packet, but also cell phone uses and stuff like that. It actually provides the, a more offline experience for a variety of custom applications that would allow you to, uh, you know, going back with the large CTP with the reference implementation of uh, getting the incremental changes of those data plays and all that. So anybody has any comments on that and wants to talk about that tomorrow, I'll be happy to uh, do that. And finally, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, we get paid to do this. And at the end of the day, we all have to answer to a boss or even worse, a customer. Um, so how do they like it? How do they like, you know, setting us off for a year and a half to go play with old data and do some of this stuff? And the answer is, they actually like it quite a bit. Um, we're still trying to convey to them what old data is, but what they see from their eyes is that they saw us go away for six months, make something that they still don't quite understand what it is, the old data provider, and then after that, hit the ground running, knocking out one UI after another, and they do cognitive studies on these UIs to see how they perform, and that it affects someone's ability to use the system. So there's a lot, of, a lot of emphasis put on these UIs. So the team was able to take the OData provider, and essentially, if you think about it, it took all the complex operations you normally have to do on the client to talk to a, one of your legacy systems, and focused it all in one place. And it gave the people that were doing the client code the freedom to run and do what they do best. Write the UI, write the service app, write the model for Android app, think about how the HTML5 app's gonna look like instead of worrying about how HTML5 is gonna make a SOAP call. Um, so the rapid development of the, of the UI experience was greatly appreciated by the customer uh, to the point where they had just come back for more and more and more saying, hey, make another client. Make that model for Android client. It sounds like a really good idea. And we've been able to address that and provide great customer service to our customer because we're using OData to simplify our back end and wrapping these C2 systems. So they've been able to, to vet out UI experiments, and some of them I can't go into because they're classified, in record time with minimal investment, all because of our initial investment in the OData provider. So it's been very positive. And brings us to our conclusion. Just about on a half hour mark. Any last minute questions? I, I, I've got two. The um, one is sort of uh, very particular, so you should be able to answer three. I have two questions. One's uh, very particular, so you should be able to answer it quickly. Um, so I'll give it first, uh, but please hold off on, on it. Uh, the second one is, have you applied the uh, technology to emergency services or disaster recovery situations? So the first question is, um, do you use lat long hashing in order to see whether or not you've got merge collision on your maps? Um, and the second question is this issue of uh, additional application terms of emergency response, um, setting up demand control situations in emergencies. Well, hashing on lat you know, we know we don't do that. We typically just do some simple boundary boxing um, for the most part. Um, the second one, 
other other uses of command and control systems do extend into the emergency response area. This particular effort has not been used there. As a company, as, you know, Nuance Bike or as a consulting company, we have put out some bids. They have I can't talk about them, but uh, we do actually do some business in that area, and so it's very likely that you will see this stuff. But right now, the answer is definitely no. I will not repeat the question. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, uh, had, had you looked into Monodroid, Monotouch in your efforts to build a cross-platform data yes. services client? Yeah, that's actually what we're using. That's what you're referring Monodroid to? Monodroid and Monotouch. Yes. And uh, the, the big thing for us is that we have a fairly large core of code that wants, we want to do this offline OData consumer slash provider, the next step. And that code base is in C Sharp, and the model for Android was an easy fit. We actually did it how many weeks? One, like two, two, it was like two or three days. Two or three days, and it was done by a intern. So we took all our all our code and ported it to Android in three days. What is it? What is it? Is it like Centurion? Is it some cross platform? Not that this is commercial for Xamarin. I, mean, I don't endorse the product. I don't have any stock in it. I don't know if it's public, but it did compile the non GUI code perfectly. Uh, you know that the we did it with the trial slow as molasses using the emulator. We eventually bought the final product, a lot better when you use a real device, but it did do exactly what it advertised. It took our non-GUI C-sharp code and compiled it. So we're We started out with that before, what? but it was still Novell. Yes. And they got dropped, and so we dropped them. And they haven't come back yet, that's why we're asking. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I understand the pain. Yeah. It was a very emotional <laughs> April, May. <laughs> when, when phone seven now. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's you know. I think it adds a the Android platform having the background services and being able to leverage the C sharp there is an excellent opportunity for Mono for Android for us. Uh, and as far as the UI portions, they may be custom Google Earth applications. What it is is they're mini apps, basically like what we're normally writing. So we're going to have several of them all talking to this own data backend. Well, thanks everybody.